We, by the grace of God, want to simplify Christianity. And there's a number of concepts that the Bible speaks of, which we speak of again and again, but I'm not quite sure we understand what they really mean. We understand them in the context of the Bible, we understand them in Bible class, we understand them during the sermon or evangelism, but when it comes into the common places of everyday life, this is the place where we struggle to understand or apply those principles. So perhaps the fault then is simply in our understanding of what those principles are. And believe it or not, by the grace of God, I'm going to hope we can simplify them. The first one is throughout the gospel. Christ, the disciples, Paul particularly in all his letters, continue to speak and make reference to the spirit and the flesh, contrasting the two. And when you look at the second reading, the book of Galatians, it also talks about the flesh and the spirit. But what does the flesh mean? What does the flesh mean? What does the spirit mean when we discuss it in the simple human economy? You go to Galatians 5, 16 to 22, and it talks about, and herein are the works of the flesh made manifest. If I say that. You don't have to read it, because believe me, time is going to be after me, as usual. <laughs> But it says things like, these are the works of the flesh that are made manifest. It talks about lust and lasciviousness and fornication and adultery, variances, emulations, witchcraft, murder, lying, all these things. And a lot of times when we think about that, we think about the flesh and we say, well, it's this sin. But the flesh really aren't those things. The praise says these are the works of the flesh by which they are made manifest. Meaning these are the evidence. That we are living in the flesh. These are the very things that testify that we are in the flesh, but they are not of themselves the flesh. So then the question is, what is the flesh? Very simple. Again, we're trying to simplify things. The flesh simply means my will, my way, my self-interest. When you think of the flesh, don't complicate it. Don't start going to this and that scene. Flesh simply means my self-interest, period. So if the flesh means my self-interest, the contrary of that is the spirit. So when we talk about being spirit, or when the Bible refers to spirit, not what we say every single time, but when the Lord refers to the spirit, in opposition to the flesh, what does the spirit then mean? God's interest. God's will God's interest, God's own way. So the flesh, my self-interest. The spirit, God's interest. So when you go to the book of Galatians 5.22 and it talks about the fruit of the spirit and joy, peace, meekness, love, all these things are not in themselves the spirit, but they are again the manifestation of one who is spiritual. So now we go to Galatians 5 from verse 16. And I'm going to read, but now I'm going to substitute for flesh my interest and spirit God's interest. And I want you to read with me. Galatians 5 from 16. This I say then, walk in God's interest, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of your self-interest. Verse 17. For my self-interest lost it, that it, it fights, it contends, it wars, it contradicts against God's interest. And God's will confronts, opposes, or fights against my will. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that I cannot do the things that I should. But if I am led by God's will, I am not 
under law or again a slave. Then you go to the second reading, again doing the same thing. Galatians 6 from verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Verse 8. For he that soweth, that is, invest his time, his attention, his wealth, his life, in his self-interest, shall of his self-interest only reap corruption. But he that soweth, invest his time, his means, his life, into God's interest, God's will, shall from living for God, serving God's interest, reap life everlasting. It's really that simple. But someone would say, can it really be that simple? It is exactly that simple. And when you go back again, and somehow everything always goes back again to Genesis 3, you see that what the serpent actually did was simply turn Adam and Eve from God's interest to their own interest. Because when she looked and she saw that it was pleasing to the eyes, she was talking from her perspective, and it was good for food, her self-interest, and designed to make one wise. Her self-interest, she took and she ate. And all the serpent did was turn us from God's self-interest, God's interest, to what? Our self-interest. The flesh is my interest. The flesh is my will. The flesh is my desire. The flesh is my strength. The spirit is God's interest. The spirit is God's will. The spirit is God's desire. But someone will say, what is wrong with having my own self-interest? What is wrong in having my own self-interest? After all, am I not supposed to please myself? And let's look at it biblically for a moment, and I'll bring it into a practical context. We all remember when we talk about the story of Saul in 1 Samuel 15 and how it has been used at Nozim to preach partial disobedience, his total disobedience before God. God told him, go out, destroy the Amalekites, man, woman, beast, even child, and the suckling infant. Think about that. Destroy them all. Because as far as God was concerned, these people are irredeemable, and there will only be a pollution to you people. That's the instruction. And we say, oh, Saul brought back the king, he brought back sheep, and he was so silly, happy to disobey God. But I want you to practicalize that. Let's assume you're in the Marine. Let's assume you're in the Army. Let's assume you're going to war. And the Lord now tells you, shows you, Christ appears to you and says that village you're going to, there are 100 people there. Old men, old women, young children, sucking infants. I want you to put a bullet in every one of them. Guarantee. Most of you, and I say most because there's some people that are just bloodthirsty. They will kill everybody God says you should kill and kill even extra. But I'm saying most of us, can you look at a suckling infant and truly put a bullet in that baby? You will turn to God and go, this doesn't feel right. This cannot be your message. This cannot be what you want to do. We will justify ourselves and condemn God. This is what Saul did. And this is what we do every single day. Because our self-interest contradict God's interest. So when you think about it, in the ordinary sort of conditions of life, one of the things that always forces us to think, I don't want to think about flesh, and I always think about flesh as sin, is that we think the language and the voice of the flesh is always vulgar. It's always extreme. It's adultery. It's fornication. It's witchcraft. It's murder. But the voice of self-interest and the language of your self-interest is not vulgar or extreme. In the common places of life, in the arena of everyday life, the voice of my self-interest is logical. It seeks simply to please me. It cries out of the injustices I suffer. It says, why me? It says, how much longer must I suffer, Lord? It says, why do I always have to be the one who was doing, who was given, who was forgiven, who has been merciful? It says, how much longer must I have faith? What are you going to do it for me, Lord? It says, why am I the one who always has to give and nothing has been given to me in return? That is what the voice of our self-interest sounds like in the everyday arena of life. It sounds like 
Ah, uh, Sarah, go, I'm an old woman. Take my maidservant Hagar's wife and give her a child by me. It's logical and reasonable. She was way past the childbearing age. What was so wrong with that? But the voice of your self-interest cannot be partially good any way or any more than Saul's partial obedience was partially good. Because the Lord tells us that the flesh lusted against the spirit. The flesh, my self-interest, cares nothing for the desires of God. And where my self-interest is involved, it means God's interest is an all. Simple. Romans 8.8. 8. So then they that are in the flesh that is in their self-interest cannot please God. There's no ambiguity there. The flesh is my self-interest. The spirit is the interest of God. But here's the thing. How then can I become spiritual? Simple answer. Again, we're trying to simplify everything. You cannot. You cannot become spiritual. And if anybody tells you by doing this or doing that, you can become spiritual, check that person, check that word against the scriptures. There is nowhere in scripture where the Lord says by doing this or doing that, you can become spiritual. He says certain things have to be done to you in order for you to be spiritual, but there is nothing in fact that you can do to become spiritual. And someone will say, for instance, the commandments preached all the time. Someone will say, I don't steal, I don't cheat. I don't commit adultery. I don't even look at a woman or a man lustfully. I don't covet anything. I come to church. I pay my tithes. I fast. Even the 40-day fast and I do 60 days. It's I do all these things. And unfortunately, all these things do not make us spiritual. They make us religious. They make us seem righteous in the eyes of men, but they do not in any way make us spiritual or make us any closer even to the kingdom of God. In Luke 16, 15, the Lord said to them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Let me give you another common example of an evidence of self-interest, coronavirus. Every prayer, Lord, we want to come back to church. We want to worship you again. Please get rid of this virus so that we can serve you in peace. It sounds good, doesn't it? But let me ask you something. Who sent down coronavirus? Somebody's going to say, oh, it started in China. Let's even assume that for a moment. But who gave them that wisdom to start it? Isaiah 45, 7 says, I, the Lord, form the light. I, the Lord, create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these. There's no interpretation there. It is very clear. If there is evil, I do it. If there is good, I do it. Because ultimately, those workers of iniquity were also created by me. I can stop them if I want, but there is a purpose. The virus is who has ever asked, Lord, is this virus your will? See, we think about it in the context of our self-interest. We want to come back to church. We want to socialize. We want to take Christ home. We want to dance. We want to sing. But the Lord isn't looking like man. Man thinks in his self-interest. The here, the now, the things that affect me. God dwells in the reference of eternity. He doesn't look in things like you and I. He's always dealing with in eternal reference. You don't know what this virus is doing. You don't know the million things that are connected to the work God is doing. All you are thinking is the inconvenience and the fact that I'm suffocating in this match. <laughs> the prayer of the flesh. Do for me. Do that for us. Do this, Lord. You promise you will do this, Lord. Well, you do it now, but the prayer of the Spirit is simply one. Thy will be done.
there is a very practical impossibility in giving up the flesh. It is impossible for a man without a job, without means, who contends with his family, who comes home, his family are hungry, his wife is hungry, can't put food on the table, he's got a son or a daughter in school, they're about to get sent out because they can't pay tuition, the house is about to foreclose upon. It's hard for a man like that to care one cent about God's interest. His only prayer, God don't put me to shame. God bless me. God give us financial blessings. There is no single interest in God at that time. It is hard to take a woman, particularly a woman in our culture, where the same way uh, uh, Penina was always, again, aggravating Anna and talking about how she hasn't had children, she hasn't done this, and the estimate of a woman, at least to an extent, is still based on the child she's born, or if she's ever given birth to a child, or if she's ever known motherhood, to not care one bit about God's interest, because all she cares about is, Lord, when will you make me and justify my womanhood? When will you make me a mother? So all her prayers and interests, no matter how much she pretends she's there for God, she's only there for her self-interest. And take a man or a woman. They're 50, 47, 60. And every single time they have been to every married wedding, they've been bridesmaids, they've been chief bridesmaids, they've seen Brothers get married, sisters get married, friends get married. They've seen their own nieces get married. And yet, they are there. They don't have a wife or a husband yet. They go home. They read their Bible. They follow daily plans. They could go to the gym before, go to the cafe. But now, with the pandemic, they are home all day. And they sit there in their loneliness. They sit there in their affliction. There is no one to talk to. No one to keep them warm. No sense of communion, companionship. And you tell them, have faith like Abraham. Preacher, you better come with something better than that. Because the faith of Abraham is not going to keep me warm tonight. But you take someone like that. You take the man who is going through all hell and trouble, and suddenly somebody offers him money to do something slightly illegal, and they tell him, I'll pay your mortgage, I'll do this. And we say, how could he do that? Walk in his shoes and tell me you will do something different. Or you see the woman who now is taking up a lover and you know they're not married and you say she's in fornication like that Samaritan woman who had had six men in her life and even the seven she was with, Christ said, even he is not your husband. And you want to condemn them. But tell me if you understand the plight of loneliness that they have to go through. So all these things, when we have our self-interest, prevent us, again, from turning to the interest of God. But I want to go back to a familiar verse. But I touch on this a lot, but it has never been more relevant here. In Mark 10, Lord, Lord, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? You know the commandments. Thou shalt not cheat, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt do this. Lord, I have kept this all my youth. And verse 10, uh, verse 21 of Mark 10 says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. That is you and I. He loves us because he sees that we, in fact, want to. We are trying to keep the commandments. We're doing everything. But then he says, One thing thou lackest, go thy way. I don't want this to mitigate that phrase, go thy way. Meaning, go your way. Go in the way of your self-interest. The way you have carved away from me. Go in your strength and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and I shall have treasures in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Jesus, beloved, wasn't talking about money. He was talking about the riches of our self-interest. Go divest yourself of your self-interest. And what does that mean? Someone has cheated you again and again. Forgive them. You have lent money to someone who every single time you do never pays back, and they come begging you and saying, I need my, your help. My mortgage is due. I can't pay it. 
The Lord is saying, give to him anyway. The Lord is saying, there was someone who has offended you and keeps offending you. The Lord says, forgive him. And those are the poor, those who are in need of your mercy. Those who are in need of your charity. Those who are in need of your forgiveness. Those who are in need of your compassion, of your patience, of your long suffering. Go sell your right. Go sell everything in your self-interest and give to those who need you. He says, not only love those who love you, love, I tell you, those who hate you. And we say, well, I don't have anything against my enemies. It's easy to say unto your enemies, the man or the woman sleeping in your bed. I keep loving. I keep giving. And I get nothing in return. And the Lord says, love even more. And the rich young man went away sorrowful, heartbroken. Why? Because Jesus asked him to do the one thing he had no power to do. And that's why Jesus said, with man, it is impossible to get rid of your self-interest by yourself. But with God, all things are possible. When you think about that, you know, it goes back to, we say that verse is about money. Because we say it is difficult for those who have money to get into the kingdom of heaven. Then that has to mean it is easy for those who are poor, right, to get into the kingdom of heaven. Right? It should be. Okay, let's test your theory. So it is difficult for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven because when they have money, they can easily forget God, right? The poor man who sees nothing but the hunger of his children, his impoverished state every single day, unable to meet his bills, unable to provide for his children, his child is dying or he's sick and he cannot afford medical bill. What do you think he's saying to God? Like Job Wise said, cross God and die already. He too is cursing God in his heart. Oh, well, because the rich wants to have money, they always want to hurt it, they're greedy, they don't want to share it. Well, guess what the poor man does? He continues to beg God for riches. When he becomes rich, what does he say to another poor man? I work for mine. You go work for yours. So the same temptations facing the rich face the poor. And there are many rich who have entered into the kingdom of God even far more glorious. Was David not rich or not? Who could be richer than Solomon? And I tell you, beloved in Christ, David and Solomon entered into eternal glory. They are dwelling there with kings and with priests. And how many poor people leave this earth and enter into eternal abject poverty? What did Christ mean? Listen to this. And this is the conclusion of that matter on the rich young man. This is what Christ was saying to him. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty ye might be rich. Was Jesus talking about his Swiss account? The riches he gave up, his majesty, his glory, his dominion, his power as the son of God. He gave all that up. And took up the mantle of this impoverished flesh. Became a man who didn't even have a place to stay. Became like a weakling. We slapped. We pulled his beard. We stripped him naked. We beat him. At any time, all Jesus had to do was look up. And Michael would have made an end of the entire world. But he did not. He divested himself of his self-interest. And they continually said, my meat is to do my father's will. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That's the poverty he's talking about. When you still have self-interest, you are not in the place God is referring to. You're still rich. So at the end of the day, how can I then sell my riches? Let's get to that. Very simply, I said, you cannot do it, but God must do it in you. And the way God does it is by doing again in Galatians 5.24. He says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh 
with the affections and the laws. We're simplifying Christianity. And when he says they have crucified the flesh, he means he has brought you to the end of yourself. And when he says he has brought you to the end of yourself, he means he has brought you to the end of your self-interest. He has brought you to the end of your self-pleasure. He has brought you to the end of your self-seeking. But the way he does it is by crucifying. And when we talk about crucifixion, you know, we keep thinking about the cross. We have been nailed to the cross. Crucifixion simply means it is a Golgotha. It is a cross. But it is passing you through the trials and tribulations of this world, the things that absolutely contradict your self-interest, the things that continue to inconvenience you, cause you to sorrow, cause you to long, cause you to lament. But the Lord is saying those things are there for one reason or one reason only. They are bringing you to the end of yourself. And this crucifixion occurs in witness, 2 Corinthians 13, 4. For though he was crucified through weakness, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, yet he lived by the power of God. We're not crucified in strength. We are crucified in weakness. The place of our pride, where we are most invested in, where our self-interest are most invested in, is where the Lord is going to put a sword right through. And that is where we get in trouble. And what I find interesting is when the Lord starts to bring us to the end of ourselves, the idea is that he brings us into submission. He brings us into meekness, meaning extreme docileness, extreme humility, where you don't even have any right at all. But the moment the Lord starts to do that, you know what we start to do instead? That is when our self-interest protests even the more. Why? Is it this? Am I the only one this must be happening to? The more the Lord brings us to the end of ourselves, the more that self-interest and that serpent fight and protects and says, fight for yourself. A common arena is marriage. When you find yourself in that position, you start to say, why me? Why must I go through this? Why must I be the only one given? And yet the Lord is saying, I am putting you there, not because of what you think, not because of your passions and your pleasures, the things you are seeking are your self-interest. My interest is to kill your self-interest. And I'm putting you in that undesirable position for no other reason but to bring it to an end. He puts us through all these trials and tribulations. The one who is longing for a child, the one who is longing for a spouse, the one who is longing for financial blessing, the one who is longing for healing. And the Lord holds all these things. And we think he's just punishing us. And all he's saying is, I have to bring you to the end of yourself. But unfortunately, when the Lord expects us to be at our weakest, to be at our meekest, to be at our most pliable, so he can start to do in us what it means to do, that is when we grow cold. That is when we get hard-hearted. That is when we say, I can never forgive. That is why we say, you have broken my trust, you have broken my trust, I can never forgive you. That is why we say, she has betrayed me, I can never forgive her. That's why we say he has humiliated me. I can never forgive him. And we have all these reasons that we give God as to why we want to remain in the flesh that is in our self-interest. And while we are there, we are enemies of Christ. You may be worshiping God, but the Lord is saying God cannot be mocked. That's what the second lesson said. Whoever souls invest in their self-interest from that can only reap corruption. Because your self-interest only cares about this world. And the preacher has said it. All is vanity. There's only corruption. There isn't a single investment you make in your self-interest that can take you anywhere beyond your flesh. And it is a currency that is absolutely despised and rejected in the kingdom of God. So where do we go from there? In order for me to be able to brought to the end of myself, I need God's help. And that is where grace comes in. And grace, very simply again, it's not complicated. Grace is simply the measure of God's love dispensed unto me through Christ. My measure of God's love is the grace given unto me. 
And at the end of the day, it brings us back to the first lesson. Noah and the ark. It's an amazing thing because we talk about Noah. And here, the Lord means to destroy the world. God looked and said there was nothing but wickedness in man. Nothing but wickedness in beast. Nothing but wickedness. Even the earth, he testified, had gone astray. And he said, every man has gone his own way. And he repented me that I've made them. And now the end of all life has come before me. I will destroy it all. But somehow, the entire world has inherited wickedness. But Noah was good. And a lot of times we say, oh, because Noah walked with God, he was perfect. Job walked with God, he was righteous. Abraham walked with God, he was righteous. It is a dangerous thing when we place this patriarch as an example of how God's grace comes to us because of anything we do. What I'm telling you is Noah deserved that death like everyone else. But there was only one thing that was different for Noah. And, you know, when we read about Noah, think about this for a moment. Psalm 53 from verse 2. Psalm 53 from verse 2 reads, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. one. There is nothing this man did that made them exceptional except one thing. And what is that thing? You go to Genesis 6, 9, which is where we always refer to, you know, and these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And we say, see? This is why God saved Noah. Think about that statement. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. When you take a bunch of students together and everybody gets the highest score is a 30 and everybody else gets 10%, 12%. And then you tell the person that got 30, he got the highest mark. It doesn't mean he passed. It means amongst everyone who failed, he was the only one even worthy of consideration. But he also still failed. And if you think about it, Genesis 6, 11 says, the earth also was corrupt before God. Even the earth they were walking on was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. But why was Noah spared? Genesis 6, 8, that's the beginning of Noah's story. Genesis 6, 8 reads what? But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Not because anything Noah did, he found grace. Why did God give grace to Noah? Why did God give grace to Jacob and not to Esau? He said, even while they were in the womb, before either one had done good or bad, I said, Jacob, I love Esau. I hate. There's a predetermination in the divine prerogative. And we can't question it. I don't know why God gave so much grace to David. I don't know why one man who was just trying to stop the ark from falling is killed immediately. And David, who did everything he did, the Lord still says, I will never take my love away from David. But that is grace. It is an individual relationship. It is something the Lord gives me, not because I have earned it, but something he has predetermined even from the foundation of the world upon me. And this is why Noah found grace. And grace is the thing that leads us when the Lord is bringing us to the end of ourselves. Grace is the thing that reminds you every time you fall and you think you are horrible and you think you are the worst and the people around you are saying, how can you do that? Grace is that thing that lifts you up, that says my love is still with you. When the world says you were caught in adultery, we must stone you because that's what the law says. Grace is the thing that starts to write in the hearts of men. That I am the law. I am the end of the law. I am the Christ. This is the thing that now stands and says, let he who is without sin. He could have said, let he who hasn't committed adultery talk the first stone. 
a majority of them will have stoned her. But to let them know the standard of his measure, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Grace is the thing that sustains her. Grace is that thing. Yes, sir. Uh, Second Samuel chapter 7 from verse 12. Yes. And when thy days be fulfilled. Yes. And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Yes. And we shall up their seed after thee. Yes. We shall proceed out of your bowels. Yes. And I will establish his kingdom. Yes. He shall build the house of my name. Yes. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Yes. I will be his father. He shall be my son. Yes. If he commit iniquity. Yes. I will chasten him with the rod of man. Yes. And with stripes of the children of men. Yes. But, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. God bless you. Who can question God? You can't ask God why one person has grace. This is the voice of grace. I love the fact that this church is called that. But we have to start to remember what that is. And so just wrapping it up, when you look at the ark, it is exactly what we're talking about. Think about this. A man who wasn't worthy of salvation receives salvation because God says, my grace, that is my love, has found you. Not because of anything you did. Oh, people will say, well, because he actually, he offered this great beast. He offered this sacrifice. And it was a sweet smell and aroma to God. And that's one of the reasons God loved him. Really? He sacrificed a pigeon, a goat, and a bull. And because of that, this God, who was so great, was so moved by the smell of goats and pigeons that he was moved. Psalm 50 from verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or for thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. He says, I know you guys are good at doing that. There's no fault in you for that. But he says, I will not take bullocks out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? So it has nothing to do with the sacrifice. The only thing pleasing to God is himself. And this is why only Christ would have done it. The begotten of God, the appearance of God, the personification of God, the aroma of Christ is that grace upon you. The love of God through Christ is what he smells and he remembers his mercy. Not because of what you do. Not to put my father on the spot. I remember one of my biggest challenges has always been, why didn't you make me like him? <laughs> this man, when nobody's in church, he will come in here, he will kneel down right there and bow his head. It's not because anybody's here. You will come to church some days and think nobody's here. He's here, prostrate in front of the church, praying, praying. He says, fear God. And every time he says that, guess what? I want to run from God. But he says it because that's the way he is. And I'm like, God, what must I do? I wonder the Lord said, shut up. Do you think he's that way by his own power? I made him that way. The Lord doesn't call the righteous. The Lord calls men unworthy of his grace. And he makes them righteous by the mystery and the working of his grace. I made him that way. I put that grace in him. I put it in him to follow me, to fear me. And he couldn't disobey anybody if he wanted because from the predetermination of the world, I had set that love upon him. So if he starts saying, I want to do like the balloon, he shall let you in trouble. <laughs> because the grace given to you is very different. That ark, think about it. The Lord was the one who brought the flood. The Lord was the one who was destroying the world. The Lord was the one who told Noah what to do. The Lord was the one who gave him the specifications of the ark. The Lord was the one who made provisions of the wood for the ark. The Lord is the one who gave him the wisdom to build the ark. The Lord was the one who told them who to bring into the ark. The Lord was the one who also did what? The Lord says after they had all entered, he said he shut them in. What did Noah do that God didn't provide? There are wild beasts in there. You think they could not have eaten Noah? Yeah, by some grace, lions didn't eat. Snakes did not pierce. And then when the storm came, the Lord was the one who also set the wind, directing the ship that he didn't dash into a mountain. This is grace. 
This is the cross of Christ. He puts you in his ark. He puts you in his love. And he tells you, though you fall six times, rise seven. My grace is with you. But here is the key, and this is the conclusion. Grace isn't there simply to keep you sinning. The Lord said in Romans 5.20, he says, as sin increases, grace increased even much more. And people read that and go, oh, okay. I can keep increasing my sin. No. But Romans 2, 4 tells me one thing. He says, oh man, do you show contempt for the riches of the goodness, the long suffering, and the masters of God, not knowing all these things are there to lead you to repentance. Grace is that ark that leads you and makes you fall forward. You may think you're falling backwards, but in fact, you're falling forward. And when you think about the life of Job, all the story of Job means is the extent to which God will go to bring a man to the end of himself. I will take everything he has depended on. I will take everything his self-interest has built, his wealth, the children he depends upon, the wife he's looking on, his integrity and his honor. There is nothing I will not take from a man until I bring him to the end of himself. And then I did that with Job. And when Job reached the end of himself, because when you reach the end of yourself, suddenly there's nothing blocking your view with God. He said, I've heard about you with the hearing of the air, but now I see you and I repent in dust and ashes. That's the purpose of grace. Where are you in your situation that the Lord has locked you in and shut you in like he did Noah? It's not because he wants you to suffer. Your self-interest does not concern him. He wants to kill him. Until his interest become the ruling desire in your life. Amen.